I'm David Torsivia. I'm Daniel Forkner. And this is Ashes, Ashes, a show about systemic issues, cracks in civilization, collapse in the environment, and if we're unlucky, the end of the world. But if we learn from all of this, maybe we can stop that. The world might be broken, but it doesn't have to be. David, here we are for another chat show. How about it? We're actually in person right now. Oh, in person. That's this pretty is, cool. Yeah. Um, normally you are in New York. I am in Atlanta, but not today. This time we decided to have the most expensive, in terms of carbon emissions, uh, episode ever. So, Right, because uh, <laughs> we met in El Paso a few days ago. Mm-hmm. Did a little bit of adventuring there, and then we took a long drive today, woke up early, drove Near the border, ended up in Tucson, Arizona. Mm-hmm. And Daniel says the word adventuring, but it's actually just been a lot of work. Yeah. Well, not too much work. but A nice balance of work. I mean, we've been here for work, right? This isn't just a vacation. We're not spending all the Patreon money, you know, just on lavish El Paso parties. And, and spas and expensive dinners. No, we're here uh, spending that money in the gift shops of places like the uh, uh, National Border Patrol Museum. What, David? Did you say National Border Patrol Museum? Oh, yeah. We uh, went on a House of Horrors uh, tour, which I, I don't, I think that's maybe a good way to describe it. Yeah. Uh, I was actually surprised there even was a Border Patrol Museum. Well, we, we got to El Paso and, and we had an interview actually cancel on us. So we had some time to kill him. We're like, oh, let's explore the city. Let's see what there is to do. And we open up this map that's like cool tourist things to do in El Paso. And Mm -hmm. lo and behold, I spy with my little eye the National Customs and Border Patrol Museum. Right. So of course we had to go there. Yeah, so we hopped in the car, the vehicle. Uh, We drove up a six-lane highway up towards a mountain. And once you get to a small, you know, stucco shed... Well, no, Daniel's doing a bad job to describe this. Let let me explain. Okay. So first off, uh, El Paso has this huge... Uh, army base in it, Fort Bliss. And uh, the the museum is right next to the fort um, in this military area. And like I said, there's this giant six-lane highway cutting through all this unbelievable suburban sprawl everywhere. El Paso is a city defined by sprawl, really, it, since that suburb episode is like readily on my mind. This, it, it really is a great example of it. But so anyway, we get there. Of course, the highway is also shut down because there's been some accidents. So we have to take all these, all these side turns. And, and anyway, we get to the museum. And we notice that there's this beautiful pasture of, mm-hmm. of desert sit like sage and wild brush and right. whatever all next to it. First thing I wanted to do is hop out the car and, you know, skip through the field. Yeah, go see like the cacti and stuff. Yeah. But uh, instead, as you pull through this parking lot, you're, you notice these signs all of a sudden that say, danger, do not enter, uh, live ammunition, uh, do not remove under penalty of law. Do not enter under uh, risk of death. And then, and then a picture of two people like flying away from the fact that they just got exploded. Yeah. So first off, to set the scene here, like Daniel mentioned, there's this horrible, just rectangular stucco building with, with no discerning features. And you drive in and you're in this unbelievably empty parking lot because only fucking weirdos go to the Border Patrol Museum to begin with. And then this museum and this parking lot is set in the middle of this live fire testing zone. Um, I, I guess it's not operational anymore, but it's still filled with like unexploded anim- ammunition. Yeah. So you can't walk out of the, the parking lot or you risk being blown up or prosecuted or whatever. And, and I, I, it really sets the tone for the rest of the museum. Mm-hmm. Then you walk up to the front door and it's this like very uninvited door it's like this metal door with no window and it looks like it's locked and you're like okay i guess i'll go in and you reach for it not even knowing if the door is going to open at all we pull it open and here we are in this house of horrors right right um of course the man asks us to sign the visitor log but how would you say the the museum's kind of divided into three sections you have the left side you have all the border patrol like historical vehicles well and, and also spoils of war so like some of their asset forfeiture goods are stationed over there but then on the right side you have the you know history of the border patrol uh, you have some mannequins featuring some of the different uniforms that they've worn throughout the years you have a bunch of artwork that has been submitted celebrating border patrol what was the funniest piece of art you saw david oh man so so this whole museum was just covered in art and i guess some of it was painted by former border control guards 
Um, I think others were just people inspired by Border Patrol, which there was a strange amount of people who just like seemed really into Border Patrol um, in El Paso and in this museum as well. But, oh man, some of these sketches, there was one, or there were a couple in particular. One of them was called something like the Empty Water Jug, and it was a painting of a uh, immigrant, presumably a Mexican, lying under this tree trying to find some shade with this poured out water jug next to it, like, I guess, dying because some Border Patrol agents came and emptied the jug. And some Border Patrol agent was like, you know what, this is like a cool scene to paint. So I think I'll do that and then donate it to the museum. And so that was on the wall. Uh, there was this horrible poem, which I think you look like you want to read this, some of this poem. Well, I'm looking it up, but I just came across one of the artwork that you, you shared with me. This is my favorite. It's called uh, Tracker's Heritage. And it depicts a Border Patrol agent uh, kneeling down on the ground with a cowboy hat, uh, looking at some tracks. You know, he, he's tracking somebody. And in the clouds is the faces of, or the spirits of a former border control officer and then a Native American who's like reaching out of the clouds with his spirit arm to rest his finger on the shoulder of the kneeling down border patrol, you know, transmuting his tracking ability to this border patrol agent to help him find, uh, you know, the illegal alien crossing the desert. (laughs) I mean, the entire museum was, was filled with these like weird tone deaf things. I made a, a giant Twitter thread, um, and, and we'll link that as well as some of the, the pictures from this museum on the website. So please check those out because uh, they, there's no way I can put this stuff into words. It was such a weird place. Daniel and I were the only ones there, unsurprisingly, except for this uh, strange man who showed up just to buy things at the gift store, I guess. And he took like 30 minutes taking pictures of Border Patrol stuff before he finally decided on a t shirt. But I, like, that's what I'm talking about. These like border patrol enthusiasts, like this guy just loved border patrol. So he showed up to like buy a shirt to support them or something. <laughs> do you have that poem? I do. Um, it's quite long though. Just read, read some of the, the good sections, like the burrito. Yeah. Okay. It's called a sign cutters memories and a sign cutter is, uh, you know, sign cutting is the process of following the tracks, right? And border patrol does this a lot. They have these dirt roads that follow not just the border, but also alongside the main strip of asphalt roads. And what they do is they, they'll bring their trucks and they'll drag a bunch of old tires down the path to kind of clear it. And then they'll come back later to see if anyone has disturbed the tracks. It's called sign cutting. Yeah, if there's footprints or other drag signs showing that people have crossed at some point, making it a point of interest. And we'll talk more about some of the Border Patrol actual activity that we saw in, in just a moment. Uh, so here's some excerpts from A Sign Cutter's Memory by Wes Selman. I was cutting sign along the line when I spied a track headed north. The design was mesh and the track looked fresh, so followed I it for what it was worth. The stride was short and the depression was light, and I figured it wouldn't be long till I caught sight of a little mite from way down in Makoa Khan. But after a while, I guess about a mile, I hadn't caught sight of that dude his stride was short, but he was making me work. Now that alien was being downright rude. <laughs> uh, let me skip some. Where's the burrito? It's towards the end. <clears throat> the sun had moved high and brightened the sky and shone down with oppressive heat. And my stomach began to growl and send a complaint. It was telling me it was time to eat. So I found a tree that offered some shade. And that's where I parked my Jeep. Then I broke out a burrito of tortilla and beans and ravenously began to eat. And as I savored that Mexican delight with the aroma wafting on air, I began to feel that I wasn't alone because from somewhere I could feel a stare. As I gazed about, I saw a mesquite that grew thick and close to the ground, and from out of that bush I could see two eyes staring at me scared, big and round. I said, Oigo Jose, ven pa' acá. Tienes hambre y quieres comer? And as he emerged from that thorny bush, he did so with a dignified air. An extra burrito I had in my pack, I offered to Guanajuato Joe. And after he had eaten and had a drink, I said, let's load up, it's time to go. (laughs) And back at the station, I unloaded my catch with all the paperwork yet to be done. I'd been up since four and my feet were sore. I tell you, I was ready to go home. I bet uh, Guanajuato Joe was ready to go home too. (laughs) As I filled out the forms and took his prints, I asked an important question of Jose. I said, who do you know and where are you going? And he said, yo tengo parientes in LA. I finally got home after a long day of field and mused as beer ran down my chin. 
Come six o'clock the very next morning, I'd be back out there tracking aliens again. Someone was proud of this poem and they framed it and they hung it in a museum. And that really, I think, captures the Border Patrol Museum in a nutshell. I mean, I mean, there's so many things that, that, are, that are wrong with this museum, David. For instance, uh, the 1929 Border Patrol's smallest catch, uh, a picture of two smiling Border Patrol officers with a, uh, it looks like a boy that can't be more than like four or five years old, you know, like at their feet, just like really mm-hmm. sad. Um, they had a bunch of vehicles that they had, uh, like makeshift vehicles that they had confiscated. Yeah, one of these was one of my favorite ones. They had this amazing uh, raft that was put together um, very ingeniously by a, a, a lot of people trying to leave Cuba and find refuge in the United States. And uh, so they had this. What year, what year was that? This was 1994. Uh, so a, a year when a lot of refugees were still coming over. And um, I'm using that word because that's the word that they used. And, and they had this this piece of paper on uh, the top of the boat that said voids to freedom. And I love this. Um, let me just read it real quick and I'll explain why I love it. So, so you're looking at the boat. It's what it's like. Yeah. It's a makeshift boat. It, it's like, it's like the bottom is a tarp that they've attached and it's like just crudely welded uh, like car parts and stuff. Like it's, it's an unbelievable construction and I can't believe they made it from Cuba to Miami with this. But um, let, me, let me read the description. This voids to freedom okay. on June 16th, 1994. Four Cuban refugees landed at Bud and Mary's Marina, located at Tea Table Key, Florida. They were in a raft made out of scrap metal, tire tubes, wood, and blue canvas. An outboard motor powered the raft during their one and a half day voyage. The refugees were arrested and then processed by the Immigration Service. The raft was seized and transported to the nearest U.S. Border Patrol station. All were charged with violating Chapter 8, U.S. uh, United States Code 1324. Right. there's, there's your voyage of freedom. Huh? Yeah, so they literally call this a voyage to freedom. Um, and, and then it ends with, with them explaining how every single person was arrested and charged with crimes against the United States of America. And I think this one's so funny because it really is this like split person. They can't figure out like, oh yeah, Cuba is bad. You know, like we see Cuba as like a, it's a dictatorship. And obviously people want to come to America where there's so much freedom here. You know, I'm a Border Patrol agent. I love freedom. Right. Um, so these are like heroes leaving this like horrible place coming to somewhere good also the the explicit definition defining of these people as refugees yeah it literally says refugees in this museum voyage to freedom but then as soon as they get here they talk half of the description is about how they fucking arrested these guys and and charged them with crimes yeah um and and they don't see anything wrong with that they don't see like like the hypocrisy in any of this this stuff and right behind it they have a a painting of a bunch of refugees in a raft about to be picked up by a coast guard and then sent back to Cuba. But that's all, that's the whole museum. It's all these like, like things where you can only understand it through like uh, heroic sort of eyes. If you have just such a fucking twisted view of the world and of people in the United States and borders and like laws and rules and, and authority. And, and it, just, it has to be so just like folded in and, and twisted in on itself to, for any of it to make sense and not just be this like crazy, like what the fuck is going on? Well, well, my favorite asset that they, uh, they displayed in the museum, this is something they captured on the border. It is a piece of plywood with uh, two uh, metal like aluminum poles uh, off the side of it with four really terrible rubber wheels. It's, it's basically like, you ever seen like a uh, moving dolly, you know, something you put under a fridge to move it onto a truck? Like not, e- not even the ones with handles. It's just literally a platform with wheels. This is what this is. And they have a photo of them like in a crane <laughs> uh, going over a chain link fence to find this thing stuffed under a like a concrete pylon underneath a bridge. Uh, and they have this like long paragraph about how they seized this thing. And like, it, 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 to me, it's like a great display of like the waste of resources, right? Like we're celebrating the fact that we used a crane and a whole bunch of manpower and all these resources and money and time and salaries to capture a. Uh, a piece of plywood with some wheels on it. Yeah, I mean, the whole museum was like that. There's these things where, once again, if you view it from any sort of rational or empathetic perspective, just nothing makes sense. But if you're um, like super dedicated to rules and authority and uh, the idea of America as this completely sovereign place that could do no wrong, then it, it, it's awesome. It's an awesome place. It makes you feel gung-ho. Yeah. Um, anything else we want to say about the Border Patrol Museum? 
No, just uh, be sure to go check out those pictures and, and the thread. Uh, there's a lot more there, but it, it's hard to explain all of it without you being able to just see some of the, this stuff. It, it's hard to explain. There was one last section of the museum, I guess, that we should mention it was the uh, uh, memorial wall, which had all the uh, deceased border agents. And they had a big book that told a little bit about each agent with their photo and, and how, how they passed. And it was almost, it reminded me of that. That book in Game of Thrones, you remember, where they have like the deeds of every knight of, of the King's Guard or whatever, and like their history and stuff. It was basically like a Border Patrol version of that. Right, right. But what was funny is Daniel and I started flipping through this book, and almost every single person that passed in this book died in a single vehicle accident. Yeah. Meaning they just crashed a car by themselves and, and died. It, like, like literally 75, 80% of them. One of them was a heart attack, though. Yeah, some of them had like heart attacks. Like we only found, I think, two who seemed to be any sort of uh, actual attack or, or injury from a cartel or from a migrant or something. But uh, the vast majority were people dying either because of their their health or because of their inability to drive. And at some point, I guess the wall was almost like a wall of Border Patrol's worst drivers, um, like a memorial wall to that. But can I say that? Can I say that on here? Uh, it's it it was it it just reminds me of those police statistics where police are always trumping up about how deadly right, their right. job is, and it really isn't even when you take everything in. But when you start digging even deeper into those police statistics, almost all of those deaths, like it, once again, that seventy five eighty percent figure, are just cops in single vehicle accidents killing themselves. Yeah, which is not to say you know obviously it's it's a tragedy when anyone dies, especially you know uh, some are less tragedies than others. But, you know, carrying out their professional job. But I, the, the point, of, you know, the reason to point that out is like, well, where's the, you know, where's the memorial book for all the roofers, right? Where's the memorial book for all the mm -hmm. uh, loggers who, or, or truck drivers, right? Who Maybe we just haven't found that museum yet. Yeah. Uh, maybe yeah. there's one in Tucson. Yeah. Maybe we're just not searching hard enough. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, we're here in the, the Southwest United States because... We are preparing a, a number of shows, a few shows on immigration in the U.S. And, and what people are doing to fight back what we believe are really unjust laws and policies going on. And, you know, we'll, we'll be talking about that more in the coming weeks. But one thing I did that I mentioned two weeks ago is visit a refugee who's being detained in a basically a, a prison. You know, these are all over the country. Many people don't realize all the attention when it comes to people who are crossing the border is at the border. But people don't stay on the border very long when they get picked up by Customs and Border Protection or Border Patrol or ICE or whatever. Usually they're held for a couple of days and then they're shipped off to another facility somewhere in the United States. It could be New York. It could be Kentucky, North Carolina, California, right? There are a huge number of these facilities and we will put a map of them on the website if you're interested in seeing you know, which ones are close by you. Right. Now, 70% or more of these facilities are privately uh, constructed, privately managed, uh, which is in contrast to just, you know, 1% of federal prisons are private. So this is a big contrast to that. And, you know, I've, I was trying to figure out who decides like where they're sent, like what is the system? And, and it appears to be that it's really just the federal government has contracts with these private uh, corporations. CoreCivic is the main one, which used to be Corrections Corporation of America, something like that, CCA. It's now called Core Civic, And so the federal government has contracts with all these private prisons to keep a certain number of beds filled with migrants, refugees, those seeking asylum. And one of those detention facilities is in Georgia, uh, Stewart Detention Facility. It's the largest facility in the Southeast. It used to be the largest in the country, privately run by Core Civic, And so uh, I wanted to visit someone in this facility, so I found a local nonprofit organization that organizes visitations. And if you want to do that yourself, and if you want to do that yourself, I want you to go to freedomforimmigrants.org, find their visitation network, and you can choose your state and find the organizations that are local to you who are organizing visitations to the facilities that might be in your own backyard or just a couple hours away. And before you do that, go to freedomforimmigrants.org and find their visitor volunteer resources page. And there's a document there that kind of explains not just the history of some of these concentration camps, but how to prepare yourself and your group before you go and, and how to interact with someone who's detained to maximize the way you can benefit 
them. And if that's not enough, you can find some more resources at detentionwatchnetwork.org. Um, they have a membership directory site where you can find all the organizations in your state who are working not just to do visitations, but also advocate for those who are being detained. These are legal groups, uh, all kinds of different groups. But anyway, so I went to Stewart Detention Facility with my girlfriend. And I'm sorry, everyone, Daniel is taken. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure no one is disappointed to hear that. <laughs> keep going, keep going. And, um, it, it, was a, it was a great experience. It was equal parts heartbreaking, but also really inspiring. You know, there was a, a one person who organized it who has kind of inspiring background to me. He came from uh, management consulting at one point, looked at his life, looked at what's going on in the world and said, I don't need to be doing what I'm doing. I need to be you know, in the field helping to combat the injustice going on. So he really uh, started organizing some of these groups and taking a part in this organization. We met a ton of great people in this process. And so real quick, I'll just talk about the experience. First of all, Stewart Detention Facility is in Lumpkin, Georgia. And if you haven't heard of that, it's because it's in the middle of nowhere. Lumpkin, Georgia, David, is so small, it does not even have its own postal service. Like there are houses, but there's no, there's no mailboxes. Is there a central lump? <laughs> I assume that there's a uh, postal service like somewhere where they can go, maybe like... No, 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 not a postal service, like a lump. It's Lumpkin. Where does where's the lump? It's uh, Stewart Detention Facility is the lump. It's the cancer. Yeah, it's the cancer. It's a tumor. It actually wasn't named Lumpkin until after the facility came. Yeah, before it was called Awesomeville. Yeah. Well, you know, and this is what these private corporations do. They find these towns in the middle of nowhere, these rural, you know, uh, countrysides, and they they say, hey, you know, let us build this massive facility. We're going to bring jobs. Uh, but then what we find out is that. No one in Lumpkin actually gets employed at this facility. A lot of the guards are, you know, having to commute from like Columbus, Georgia, which is like 45 minutes away or other cities. And then most of the labor that's done inside the facility is actually done by the detainees themselves who get paid about a dollar a day, sometimes $4 if they're lucky, uh, depending on the work. So, you know, they're the ones that are doing all the labor. So it's really a myth that the corporations are bringing this economic activity. But so anyway... <clears throat> We pull up to the detention facility, and first thing you notice is the barbed wire everywhere. And we walk up to it, and there's a gate. And have you ever seen like an airlock or like the depiction of an airlock, mm -hmm. like a space station or something? Like two gates with a space in between. That's, that's how you get into this facility. You press a button. Uh, the first gate opens. It's like this big metal chain fence, and it's like... Wow. That's really good. Yeah. And then we all walk in to the space in between and then it closes behind us and then the second door opens. So it's real dramatic, right? And there's like huge barbed wire everywhere. Like a uh, fog rolls out. And yeah. We walk in and there's like a single person at the check-in table. Uh, we give them our names and tell them who we're visiting. Now, why do we have to tell them who we're visiting, David? So they know who to bring out? Well, that too. But what's interesting is that what they do is they go, you, you show up, you say, I want to visit this person. And then they go back and they ask the person if they want to be visited. And sometimes they decline. Now, why might they do that, David? Because they're making $4 that day. Actually, the, the guy that we interviewed, we did have to pull him away from his uh, chef uh, work detail. So th that could be the case. But more often than not, they might decline because these facilities only allow people to visit them once a week and for one hour. That's the maximum they get. So if they're expecting someone else, they're not going to That's right. let someone random come in? Exactly. So I show up, I say I want to visit this person, and they're like, well, maybe my wife will visit in five days. I don't know if she will, but maybe she will. And I don't want to risk the chance that I won't get to see her when she shows up because some other person came to visit me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really messed up. And, and the family members have found a way around that by showing up on like Saturday night. They'll visit for an hour, and then they'll wake up Sunday morning. The clock resets. They go visit their family member, and then they'll wait two weeks to come back. Mm. It's crazy. Can you imagine one hour once a week? That's crazy. So anyway, uh, the guy we visited, uh, he did come. We walked back there, blah, blah, blah. And it's a glass window. And on one side, he sits. And on the other side, we sit. And there's a telephone on his side and a telephone on our side. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, just like the kinds of things you see in movies when there's like a, somebody who murdered like 10 people is talking to like the reporter or whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, I mean, this is the crazy part to me because, again, I mean, this is something we'll talk about in the immigration, but none of these people, or most of them, have not committed crime. 
Well, n- not not a crime that you would say or I would say, but as far as the United States would say, like, you're here and you're not supposed to be. That's a crime. You're going to jail. No, no, but not even. Because again, it's not a crime to show up on the border and seek asylum, which is what all these people are doing. Right, right, right. And, and so he has no crime. He, he has no crime that's been charged against him, but he's been sitting in this facility for nine months. Okay. In addition to the facility he sat in in Mississippi, basically waiting for a judge to tell him whether he's going to be deported or if he's going to be granted asylum. But he's treated like a prisoner this whole time anyway. One hour a week. Yeah. That's, that's all you can be visited. Mm-hmm. That's pretty uh, prison-like. One dollar a day to cook all the food. Well, this is, I mean, this is kind of funny. It, and In the middle of nowhere. Well, the, the funny thing to me is that this is... The barbed wire. Dude. Okay, yeah. <laughs> this is a correctional facility, right? That is in the name uh, of the, the company that runs it. No, no, no. Now it's Core Civic. Okay, well, Core Civic, and I guess they call it technically a detention center. But it's designed like a prison, and it's prisons are supposed to be "quote unquote" correctional facilities, people to places to rehabilitate criminals back into society. But uh, I mean that illusion, which which was never really actually uh, stuck to in any sort of actual way, is is not, they're not even pretending here. These are people who literally don't need to be rehabilitated in any way. Um, they're just being held somewhere because there's nowhere else to go. But they're treated like a prison. Uh, the, the barbed wire, double gates, uh, once a week. They're working the rest of the time, forced to work, mm-hmm. basically. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm sure there's, there's punishments if they're not working. Oh, here's another thing. Well, you want to talk about punishments. So um, there was one guy in here who worked, didn't get paid, so went on hunger strike, sent straight to uh, isolation, right? Worked, didn't get paid, said, that's not fair. So, okay, well, you're going to isolation. Now, the law is you can send somebody to uh, isolation for up to two weeks for any cause, mm-hmm. any reason. And it, it's not until about two weeks where they will even investigate whether or not you had cause to send them to isolation. So, you know, just imagine what goes on in there. And I'm sure there's no recourse if they find that you didn't have any cause. I'm sure it's just an oopsie. And they're like, oopsie, they let you go. Oopsie, yeah. There's there's no fine. They don't put the 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 CEO who you know pushed them into uh, isolation also into isolation or something. Uh, it's just a whoopsie. Yeah, just a whoopsie. And and we can move on in a second here. But real quick, just the story was kind of heartbreaking to me. This is an African guy. Long story short, his life was in danger. Also, the government wanted to imprison him because of the district that he was born and raised in, which is uh, has some colonial conflicts there with the history. So he fled his country, paid to send his wife to America. She eventually got asylum. Then he skipped over to Latin America, trying to find a place to stay. He was detained in a country there for uh, several days, eventually decided to come to the United States to seek refuge. And that's, that's, the, uh, long, that's, the, that's the end of the story. Now he's sitting in, in prison for close to a year now. Do you think they hold uh, like white people from European countries in these detention centers? Uh, I'd be surprised. <laughs> I would honestly be surprised. I'm just, I'm just. I wonder if there's any, like, like if an Irish guy comes yeah, over and he's just like, I'd like to see Seamus, and uh, you like get there and there's just like very red haired Irish guy telling his like tale of woe. For some reason, something like I have some sort of sense tingling. I'm not sure what it is, but I think that there's probably not a white people in these detention centers. I, I can't imagine why that might be though. Um, well, you, I'm skipping ahead here, but you know, we just went through a, a checkpoint, a border control checkpoint. Oh man, we had so many border patrol experiences today in our drive, y'all. Yeah, just driving from El Paso to Tucson. We took the scenic route, to be fair. I mean, I guess we were asking for it, right? Yeah, well, we, we sort of intentionally decided to drive along the border. Uh, there's a highway, Highway 9, it runs into another highway, Highway 80. And this is sort of the border route if you're trying to drive from Texas to uh, New Mexico to Arizona. And uh, we, saw, we saw a lot of the border. We saw the wall in all, all sorts of places. We saw where the wall just ends, mm-hmm. just like literally yeah. stops and there's nothing else there. Right. Um, it's really funny to see this contrast where this is massive steel slat wall, uh, like this scar across the land, and then all of a sudden it just stops with no like geographic reason. It's just in the middle of a field. It just stops mm-hmm. and there's nothing. And, and, and what's Mexico and what's the United States is a stupid question because it's just these rolling hills with mountains on either side. And it, what do you know? It looks exactly the same um, mm-hmm. and it, it's beautiful. 
beautiful drive. I can't, if, if any of y'all are trying to experience yeah. some of the country, like this is a gorgeous drive. I really recommend it. The most beautiful landscape I've ever seen. Just beautiful, which is, makes all this even more of a shame because it was just covered in these white trucks with green stripes on the side. That is the, the badge of the Border Patrol. Um, and also a lot of U.S. military uh, positions stationed along the way as well. Yeah, a bunch of military trucks with uh, looks like really advanced like radar, infrared. Uh, yeah, you know. I, I imagine some of them were like uh, FLIR cameras, which are infrared cameras. I think some had dual night vision units as well. Uh, and th- th- I mean, they had these dedicated trucks. They were they were army trucks operated by army or national guard. I guess it wasn't clear. We didn't stop to ask. And uh, they would have these these like scissor lifts basically in the back of the truck that would go up and have these these thermal cameras these night vision cameras on it to scan the border. Mm-hmm. And we saw dozens of these just like every, every so often there'd be another truck and we'd say another truck and we'd, we'd, we'd yell border patrol and take a well, picture. Yeah. I was like, Hey, we should, we should start a drinking game. You know, every time we see a border patrol truck, we take a shot. No, we would have been a single vehicle accident if we, <laughs> if we had done that. We would have, would have been on the, in the book. Um, yeah. I mean, there was huge stretches of our trip where it was like, 70 percent of every vehicle we saw was a border patrol mm-hmm. at one point you know we had stopped to take a little sound sample field recording yeah do 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 some field recordings record some soundscapes taking us back to episode 44 do not disturb with the legendary bernie kraus and uh we were taking that and we had two border patrol trucks pass us and ask us like hey you guys doing all right yeah I actually, when I was walking back from one of these, uh, Daniel had already gotten in the car and I, I was walking back, the, the border patrol guy actually stopped me and he started asking me questions about if I'd seen X vehicle, uh, if I had seen this thing going around. Oh no, David, you're a collaborator. Yeah. So I told him exactly where it was and I said it was probably filled with a bunch of like illegals and whatever. Yeah. He's like, the Mexicans went that way, sir. Yeah. No, well, I, I told him, no, sir. Sorry. I've only seen a bunch of border patrol trucks driving by. He's like, are you sure? I'm like. Yeah, I was mostly looking down at my equipment. He's like, where are you from, boy? And I told him, I'm from New York. He's like, you're sure out of your element. I'm like, don't I know it, sir? <laughs> and then he's like, he's like, well, you stay safe out there. I'm like, you too. I really should have said something like, don't crash, but I didn't. And, yeah. uh, and he went off on his way. Wasn't it a felony to intimidate a Border Patrol yeah, agent? Yeah, so uh, Daniel and I also, we, we went to Mexico for a little bit here. We've done a lot in the past two days. Yeah, well, it was more than that, but... So we went down to Juarez and uh, we walked across that border. We'll talk about that at some point. But uh, we also came back through uh, the checkpoint there and we got yelled at several times by Border Patrol for breaking all sorts of rules. Oh, wait. So we got off on a tangent. The whole point of this like tangent was, uh, uh, I think you said something about white people being in detention. Oh, yeah. yeah, okay. So uh, yeah, pull, pull it back in real quick. All right. So just before we got to Tucson here, we're going up Highway 83. And lo and behold, it's what was it, 83? Yeah, it was 83. Okay, yeah. So, and lo and behold, a sign says, uh, Border Patrol checkpoint, prepare to stop. Yeah, and we're not close to the border at this point. No. So, uh, there up ahead of us is a, you know, little outpost, four or five Border Patrol trucks and two guys uh, dressed like they're in the army. Yeah. Um, like full body armor, like uh, guns and stuff. Yeah, a bunch of cones and stuff. They tell us to stop. Uh, we rolled out our window. The guy looks in and says, y'all U.S. citizens? Uh, Dang, yep. Yep. Says, yeah. All right. Have a good day. <laughs> he waved us through. Like, I'm sure there, there's no racial profiling going on right. there at all. Yeah, exactly. So that's the, that's the race element, yeah, right? Yeah, it pays to be white. So, yeah. um, did, But just to jump back to, I guess, Juarez coming back in, it, it, was, it was really, once again, interesting seeing these cities that have been cut in half basically by the border and how it interrupts commerce, how it interrupts culture, how it interrupts people's lives. And uh, El Paso is a big city and Juarez is a huge city. There's one and a half million people who live there. It's the fourth largest city in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And uh, this whole landscape is really divided by this border wall. In my head, I always saw it divided by the the quote unquote mighty Rio Grande, Mm -hmm. which is actually just like a drainage ditch, basically. From what we could tell. Yeah. I mean, in El Paso. Maybe part of the year it's like bigger, but it was basically nothing here in the middle of august but the the city is divided just straight down the middle you can see difference in in, in the roads and, and, and the, the geography and the lights um and, and how much people's lives are, are going back and forth across this border and what a huge inconvenience it is and how it interrupts commerce 
how it interrupts uh, the flow of, of money and ideas and business and whatever. And, and really, you can see very quickly that borders are bad for everyone. Like everybody's lives here is worse because of it. Economically, we're suffering because of it. This is not a beneficial thing, except for this larger idea of, of what is a state and what is sovereignty and what is power in this place and taxes and blah, 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 and all the stuff that spins off of it. But in the terms of actual practical benefits to people, there's almost none. Yeah. And so we decided to walk across the border from downtown El Paso, which at that time of the day was kind of deserted. I mean, there's a few people milling about here and there, but... But it was basically empty. Basically empty. And, and I'm, you know, compared to Atlanta's downtown, I mean, it was basically nothing. Yeah. We walk across and, and of course, as we're walking across, there's all this barbed wire. Uh, we're, going on a, we're walking on a bridge to, to get into Mexico. And on the other side of the bridge is everyone coming in. Yeah. Well, first off, nobody cares if you go to Mexico. We paid 50 cents to go to Mexico. Yeah. No papers checked. They didn't no. check papers. They didn't care. They're just like, the fee is 50 cents. We put a 50 cents in, in, in a, like a toll booth sort of mm-hmm. looking thing. Yeah. And they're like, welcome to Mexico. And we walked in. Yeah. And on the other side is a line of people stretching like as far as the eye can see. Mm-hmm. The whole bridge. And that, that, that kind of shocked me at first because, like you said about commerce, I mean, this, these are people coming to work. These are people, I don't think they're coming to shop because there's not much going on in El Paso, but uh, this is labor. Yeah. Uh, and Juarez was very different from El Paso. So this is the same exact day, same exact time. El Paso is basically empty. There's nothing going on down there. There's no mm-hmm. people out. Yeah. Um, there's not even many cars out. El Paso is like generally a dead town. And I realize there's recently a tragedy there, so maybe people aren't going out and being as active as they normally are. But nonetheless, so we walk over to Juarez, which is, it's not a peaceful town. It has a, a earned reputation for a lot of violence. And, and it would scare maybe a lot of people from being outside. You know, I, I couldn't understand that. Yeah, if you want to be nervous about walking into Juarez, just start Googling... <laughs> Is Juarez a dangerous city? Yeah. And uh, you'll start having second thoughts, which I was. Yeah, but we, we braved it. We, we went across, and it turns out we, our fears were... Totally unfounded. Yeah, we had no... It, Juarez is, is, a, is a very nice town, um, at least the parts where we were. At. We didn't walk too far, maybe a couple miles within it, and mostly in these main, main areas. But it was so crowded. It was just as crowded as New York City, maybe even more. Uh, people were out. People were talking to each other. There was a lot of commerce. There were street performances. Um, lots of street performances. Lots of street performances. We went to the cathedral there, major cathedral, and there's a park right there, and just like hundreds of people milling about in the park. Yeah, it was completely. You couldn't even walk down the roads, and and I, I say roads because literally the entire roads were blocked off just for people. And it wasn't a festival. It wasn't like a. Uh, it was just a a Saturday. People were out. Yeah, uh, of course the mercado there was really interesting to walk through. Just a lot of people, uh, as you'd expect, and, and you know that kind of contrast with what we were talking about with like the suburban landscape of America where you never really run into people. And this is a point I wish I had made during that episode when I was talking about how, you know, I get lonely a lot just hanging out at my house. You know, it's a nice house where Mm -hmm. I rent a room, very beautiful backyard, really nice neighborhood, but it's just so lonely because there's no, it doesn't feel like I'm in any place where I can meet people, nothing is going on. And as we talked about the shopping mall for so long and continues to be the social place where people from the suburbs go. And we mentioned the church. You know, a lot of people go to church in America as their main social institution. But the difference, and this is the point I wanted to make, is that as social as a church is, it gets to a point where there's no strangers anymore. And, and that's, I think, the main difference here. And you talked about the way people are segregated in the suburbs based on income, especially based on race, to where people live their whole lives they go to church, they, they go to their work, they come home, and they never interact with anyone outside of their income, race, or class. Not to mention new people coming in and out. But this was completely different when we were in Juarez. This is people everywhere, groups coming together, uh, strangers coming together, rubbing shoulders with each other, people dealing, you know, doing commerce in the Mercado, uh, just really vibrant city. Yeah, uh, I had a really great time and uh, never, never once felt unsafe. In fact, I felt significantly safer in these very populated sections of Juarez than I did walking to Juarez in El Paso through these like completely empty streets where there's nobody out except for weirdos. Yeah, I just think it's strange that, you know, we built this city in the middle of a desert, right? One of the most inhospitable climates on earth. And uh, <laughs> the way we decided to do it is pave these giant black asphalt roads where we don't even have a lot of cars going down. You certainly can't walk down them. Yeah, but we walked them. 
it's it's possible we did it yeah so <laughs> you'll get you'll get hot but you can do it you can do it but maybe we're giving away too much of our our, our border conversation right now because there is going to be a lot of content of this stuff coming soon and I, and I don't want to uh lose the impact of some of that later on well you know immigration talking about border control it's kind of a depressing topic uh here's a positive thing that i did two weeks ago that anyone can partake in. I took a 20-hour medic training course, David. Yes, this is something that I did, uh, I guess, over uh, right about a year ago, maybe a little bit more than a year ago, um, and, and had an amazing time with and recommended Daniel do, and yeah. if he finally had a chance to. Yeah, they only do it once a year in Atlanta, and so I jumped on it uh, when it opened up. Maybe explain, what is a 20-hour medic training? Yeah, wh- wh- I, know, I know people are asking, what, Daniel's a medic now? What is that, like a doctor? Do I have a doctorate in yeah. healing people? No, the, 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 that's exactly what Dr. Daniel, Dr. David. Dr. Daniel, this is Dr. The, David. the doctor, doctor show. Well, no, it's not exactly becoming a doctor because... <laughs> so, <laughs> not exactly. These are courses usually designed and run by activists. Um, and it's primarily geared towards people who are going to be in protest environments. And in protest, as people know, sometimes things go south. Things might get violent. Well, Police might throw tear gas, right? Right. Someone might get hurt. And, and, and even if those things don't happen, because let's be honest, I don't want to scare people away from protests. Most of them are very safe. Uh, most of them you have nothing to worry about. But a lot of them, you know, they're outside during the hot summer months or they're outside during the cold summer months and people get sick. Um, you know, people slip, people fall, people get heat stroke, people get hypothermia. Uh, that just happens when there's a lot of people who maybe aren't used to spending lots of time outside are. Uh, and those people need medical attention. And the street medics are the ones providing that. And of course, if things go uh, south, they have the training and the knowledge of how to deal with that. Right. So the course is designed to prepare you to pair with somebody and have the skills and have the confidence to go into a situation and help people who might be suffering from heat stroke, like you mentioned, or major bleeding or something more serious. Maybe they need CPR. And what's really interesting is you know, you can't really have a course like that without having politics involved, right? Because mm-hmm. the very fact that this course exists is a political statement. Because we have doctors, we have nurses, we have EMTs, we have a professional class of people who know how to stop major bleeding. They know how to perform CPR. And they, they are a part of an institution that is state-sponsored. And what you're supposed to do if someone gets hurt is call 911 and wait for one of these professional classes to show up and treat you. A, a huge cost to yourself, financially speaking, typically, as we've talked about several times on this show. Yeah, we have an American Healthcare series. Uh, we took calls from a number of people around the country have, who have really suffered at the hands of this American Healthcare Institution. I encourage anybody to check that out. Uh, we did hear from someone who got stabbed by an icicle while delivering pizza and then The ambulance showed up, he got charged a whole bunch of money. You know, it's a crazy situation, right? Mm -hmm. And so the reason why this course exists is because the people running it are saying, look, the medical institution that is state-sponsored has a lot of medical information that people need to know. And so rather than keeping it locked up in that institution and, and having to always be dependent on that, how can we kind of decentralize it and how can we empower people uh, everywhere to take this medical knowledge into their own hands to save themselves, to keep themselves safe, and you know, really do what needs to be done in the times of crisis. And I'll be honest, David, going into this course, I knew it was going to be run by activists. I know this is a social organization. I expected it to be run by people who are like, oh, yeah, I've been to a lot of protests, and this is like you know, some tips and tricks that we've learned along the way. But I was surprised to find that my instructors were professional themselves. One was a nurse at at a major hospital in my area. Two were EMTs who work on ambulances every single night and have come from that profession saying, this is not right the way we create hierarchies around medical knowledge. And And, and, and one of the major things they're always coming back to too, not just the hierarchies, but they feel like a lot of uh, medicine lacks consent. Uh, like you just are forced this healing onto you at all times. It's, and so one of the major things that a street medic training teaches is to always, if possible, and of course not everyone can give consent if you're unconscious or something, but, but make sure you're always doing something that people want you to be doing, which mm-hmm. so oftentimes people avoid doctors and avoid nurses and hospitals in this entire institution because 
Uh, they feel like they're not listened to. They're not part of this conversation that the doctor always knows best and forces things on them that they don't want. And uh, this radical reviewing of, of what that relationship between the person treating someone and the patient should be like is really a cornerstone of this sort of treat mm-hmm. street medic training. Yeah. And one of the most useful and practical tips that I learned that anyone listening right now should, should memorize is when you call 911. There are certain words that if you say them, triggers a protocol that requires police to be on the scene before any paramedic can do treatment, right? These are words like drugs. If you call 911 and tell, tell them that someone is having an overdose or there's drugs involved, the police have to show up. But the EMT could be outside your door. They're not coming in until the police get there, however long that takes. If you mention some kind of assault, if you say my friend was hit by someone else and they're bleeding. Uh, that might trigger the police, right? And so if you want to save time, and when you do have to call 911, get that higher care, you want to avoid those types of things. And one of the EMTs told a story about uh, uh, someone they had gone to treat. This was someone who was uh, basically dying because they needed insulin. This was a diabetic situation. And because of the way the dispatch was called, the police had to be on the scene first. And the way the police responded was by breaking into this guy's home with guns drawn and basically causing a scene before paramedics were even allowed in there to save the guy's life. Crazy situation. But, you know, overall, David, I would say I learned a lot. And I've always had this like insecurity in the back of my mind, which is I don't have a lot of medical knowledge. I took a CPR class by the Red Cross a long time ago, but I had never known how to treat major bleeding. I never knew how to do a splint or, or when, when that is necessary. And so I've always kind of had this insecurity, like I'm walking around the streets today and, and if something were to happen, if I saw someone fall, if I saw someone in mortal danger, I wouldn't know what to do. But after taking this course, I feel like I at least have a foundation to where, you know, if, if I see something, I have the confidence to at least start a process that I know will at least put them in a better situation, potentially saving their lives if that comes to it. Mm -hmm. And the confidence is key and it's huge. And I had the same thing happen to me. Um, I've had situations where I was uh, able to use some of this training. I saw, for example, a girl who got hit by a car and I was able to rush over and help her in a way that was... You saw a girl get hit by a car? Yeah, she was crossing the street and a car hit her, which um, if you live in New York, you're going to see this. So this is in New York City. Yeah. Happens all the time, but this this, well, this one happened right in front of me. It just it happens all the time in New York. So, but I knew what to do. So I ran over. Um, I was able to, to assist her in, in a proper way. Uh, I was able to get higher care that she had asked for and uh, prep her for the the EMTs and stuff when they arrived. And and uh, she eventually turned out fine. Uh, some some broken bones and stuff. But the point was, I knew exactly what to do at every step, and it was really. Um, it gave me a lot of confidence while everyone else who was there and saw this also sort of stood around not knowing what to do. And that, that, that difference is can, you know, not in this situation, but in some situations can mean the difference between life and death. Right. And, you know, we talk about climate change a lot. And one of the things I was impressed by this course is, yes, it's geared towards those in protest. But as you just demonstrated, David, these are skills that can be used anywhere in any moment's notice. And because this was run by activists, there was a lot of information on other organizing going on, other courses. And the nurse, in fact, was telling us that they were starting up a apocalypse-oriented course where, hey, we got climate change coming. There's going to be a lot more natural disasters. How do we prepare our communities? How do we uh, prepare go bags for every family in the community to have where if something goes down, we can all evacuate as fast as possible. How can we treat somebody in the event of, a, of an emergency? How do we come together as a, as a community to really set up a, a event space for treating people, for taking care of people's needs? That just really impressed me. Just the organizing going on and the, the knowledge being shared on how to prepare ourselves in the event of, of tragedy and uh, you know, violence or, or in any form. Yeah, a lot of my trainers also very similarly uh, not only th- th- they call themselves action medics instead of street medics because it, th- they see it as a larger definition where they're not just working protests, but also like say when Hurricane Katrina happened, they got together, they went down to New Orleans and they were there operating as disaster response medics. And they do that during these disasters all around the country. And once you have these skills and once you have a little bit of experience, it's really easy to apply them to all sorts of situations where these professional medical institutions fall short. And it turns out when you start looking at those things, 
there's a lot of places where that happens. Yeah. So these trainings, if you want to get involved, unfortunately, most of them, because there isn't a lot of people who are qualified to do the trainings, only happen about once a year in most major cities. I have a lot more in, in your neck of the woods, don't they? No, NICAM only does about one a year. Okay. Um, they were talking about a six-month schedule, but because of commitments and because of time, they're set to one a year. In New York, the organization, if you want to look them up, is called NICAM, New York City Action Medics, NYCAM. Uh, they have a Facebook page. But but these types of uh, street medic collectives, which is the word you want to search, exist all around the country and not just in the United States, but all around the world. And this 20-hour training that you undergo is respected between all these people. So if I come to Atlanta and there's an action and I say I was 20-hour trained by NICAN, uh, by Bob up in New York, uh, people will recognize that and they will allow me to run as a medic there. Daniel, if you were to come up to New York and mention your training, you, they would allow you to run as a medic there. Or in any other major protest, G20 or anything else like that. Well, and you know, one topic we covered in episode 73, Tear Up, Tear Down, which was the, the episode kind of on the history of tear gas, is the changing nature of protesting in general across the world. I mean, it's still obviously very varied, but what we've seen, I think, over the past uh, few years, decades, is more decentralized protest, more action groups, more uh, small group actions, right? Well, th there's a lot of really interesting things going on in, in, in protest uh, tactics and culture right now, especially in places like Hong Kong. I know people keep sending me videos of those. I think listeners do as well. So thank you for those. But a, a lot of these, these techniques are taught in these medic classes, and then uh, we can utilize them and, and spread them to other people as well. Yeah. And, and what I was going to say, though, is that, you know, you mentioned you can go to an action somewhere else and say, hey, I'm street medic trained. But one of the points they made in, in my training is that you can use, you don't have to go to an action and declare yourself as a medic, right? Mm -hmm. you can, this is something that, let's say you have a group of friends, you know, it's the five of you and you are going to go do something, some objective. Just having that medical knowledge is something that you can use as you support you and your friends in your own personal... These hypothetical situations where you and a group of crack friends go out just on a miniature protest with four or five people. Yeah, I, I think I see what you're saying, Daniel. Wink, wink. <laughs> Hypothetical, yeah, of course. I mean, there would probably be a lot of different groups going on at the same time, too, but... To do, doing different things. Yeah. I don't know what they would be doing, but yeah. it's always good to have, have someone with medical knowledge. Yeah, of course. Whatever you're doing. Yeah. Could be on the border. Who knows? <laughs> Yeah. Well, uh, with those hypotheticals out of the way, I guess, uh, you know, I guess that's a lot to think about. But think about it. We hope you will. And with all these skills and knowledge, we hope you'll do something about it too. Wink. You can find more information about everything we talked about. You can find those maps. You can find these hilarious photos of this Border Patrol Museum on our website at ashesashes.org. A lot of time and research goes into making all these episodes possible. And we will never use ads to support this show. So if you like it and would like us to keep going, you, our listener, can support us by giving us a review, recommending us to a friend, discussing these topics with your uh, family and, and acquaintances, or you know, visit us on patreon.com slash ashes ashes cast and send us uh, some financial support if you want. Uh, it helps us out tremendously and we really appreciate it. We'll send you a sticker and we actually just mailed those stickers out from uh, el paso yeah we just mailed some stickers out also we'd like to thank our associate producers chad peterson and john fitzgerald thank you so much we have an email address. oh yeah we have an email address it's contact at ashes ashes.org we've been receiving your emails and and we appreciate them we've actually got a couple shows coming up that were listener inspired yeah we're, and we're excited for those too so keep sending us great ideas because uh, we've got a, a big list of stuff to do, but we also love hearing things that we never even thought about. So Yeah, and I don't want to give them away, but some of them are... Uh, well, I'm dying to get to. Yeah, some of them are pretty morbid. Yeah. But some well, of them are land use uh, mm -hmm. related. You know. Well, we'll check it out. Uh, if you don't like sending emails, and let's be honest, who does? You can also give us a call. We have a phone number that's 313-99-ASHES or 313-992-7437. And if you call that number, you can leave us a message that will integrate into an awesome call-in show at some point. Once we get enough of these and we get the time to put them all together, 
And if you are an international listener, because we know there's many of you, don't worry, we haven't forgotten about you. Just send us a voice recording to our website, contact at ashesashes.org. You can upload it to somewhere like SoundCloud or Dropbox, WeTransfer, whatever, and uh, send it our way so we can integrate it into our show, answer your questions, and uh, put together something really special. We also have a ton of social media contacts. You can give us a follow on any of those. Ashes Ashes Cast is our username. Got some great memes, some great news stories. So just look at your favorite social media network and uh, check us out. Next week, we'll be looking at another major report coming out from your friends at some big international organization. Who knows which international organization? I guess you'll have to tune in next week to find out. Ooh, I can't wait. But until then, this is Ashes Ashes. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.